The views on this program do not reflect those of ONTV or its board of directors. Welcome to OAA Now, your home for Oakland Activities Association news and information. Here's your host, Sammy Taramina. Welcome to OA Now here. I'm Sammy Taramina, blogger around the OA, the host of Last Three Brain Cells, and the host of Between Terminas on OA Neighborhood Television. I'd like to welcome those watching on the local voice on SoundCloud and those watching on YouTube. Um, a lot to talk about this week, obviously. Um, of course, um, the big story, of course, girls basketball ending. Of course, um, you know, we had the boys basketball quarterfinals. We're down to two teams in boys basketball. Um, of course, Adams and Ferndale, both those teams are going to be in the state quarterfinals at Lake Orion on Tuesdays. So we're going to talk that. We're going to break down West Bloomfield's loss to, um, to, um, Rockford, obviously, you know, a couple mistakes I thought were made in that game. Um, awesome. I'm going to look at Sidney Hendricks's, or Kendall Hendricks's comments. Um, you know, of course, if you haven't heard, um, I know D-Zone on Twitter, um, mentioned those in the press, con- mentioned, um, her, her, um, her, uh, it was, inter- it was an interesting comment. I mean, like just saying that, you know, that they were going to be back and the next year, you know, um, you know, they, they're the ones that are going to be the ones that are going to be hungry. I mean, like they're the ones that, you know, I mean, like you got the league, you know what I mean? And you got the league and le- obviously the league, obviously they're still the hunted. And, you know, when you look at those comments, we're going to break those down obviously as well. Um, let's talk about the girls game. Let's say final between them, West Bloomfield and Rockford. Um, this is a rematch. This was a rematch of a, um, 63, 63, I'm um, 66, 63 West Bloomfield win in the, um, State semifinals last season, of course, Rockford had had three very good players. They got the Winnipeg Sisters and, of course, Grace Lyons. Um, obviously, Lyons tortured West Bloomfield last year with twenty um with twenty one points. Um, five of those were three pointers. But West Bloomfield found a way to win that game. Um, but you know, when you look at the game in general, I mean, like. Everybody thought this would have been an offensive slugfest, and it was anything but an offensive slugfest in that game. I mean, you really got to look at, you know, both these teams, you know, they both want to score. They want to go up and down. I mean, like, you know, you look at, you know, you have, like, the Winnipeg sisters. You have Lions on one side. Then, of course, you have the Davis sisters, the Hendrick sisters on the other side. Um, I'm not discounting Destiny Washington here by any means. I mean, like, but, um, but, you know, the matchup, of course, was a, um, you know, it was going to be a battle between which set of sisters was going to dominate the game. And, you know, and that's what it came down to. Um, so when you really look at how the game went, I mean, like, both teams shot was, were absolutely terrible from the field. I mean, like, both teams were ice cold. I mean, West Blue had a good start early. I mean, they were up 10-4 at one point. Rockford clawed back in the second quarter. Um, I mean, got the got the Hendrick sisters, both of them, in the foul trouble. Um, you know, and then that set up, of course, um, you know, and Rockford ended up taking a 14-12 lead at the half. Um, the foul trouble, you know, and the kind of something that I've been saying about last the last few weeks about West Bloomfield is their lack of depth. And it caught up to them in this game. Obviously, when you look at, of course, both David, both Hendrick sisters getting into foul trouble, that ended up being a big deal because it allowed Rockford to pay a little bit more attention to the Davis sisters. Um, and we know how good both um, both um, Summer Davis and India Davis are. We know how good both of them are. And, you know, it kind of, you know, the foul trouble West Bloomfield was in, it kind of set the stage up for, what would have been a low scoring defensive type slugfest. So it was 14 12 in favor of Rockford at the half. Um, third quarter, West Bloomfield, you know, went back and forth. West Bloomfield had a really nice um, basket by um, Kendall Hendricks. And then, of course, came the final two minutes. I mean, like, especially the last 130 of that game, where, of course, if you haven't seen the game, um, I mean, like, West Bloomfield's up, you know, after Davis layup. Grace Lyons steals the ball, and West, and the Rockford runs a, um, their ball movement in the final, in the final stretch was just absolutely spectacular. I mean, 
you look at what um, they did. I mean, the side to side, ball to ball movement. Both Winnipeg sisters got a touch, um, and then it led to the um, Grace Lions um, three point shot. It was a very contested three point shot with 38 seconds left, and then what? And then after that, West Bloomfield, um, you know, tried going quick and threw the ball away. Um, with 33 seconds left, but you know, but West, but Rockford couldn't close the deal. Um, <laughs> so it was 38-36 in favor of Rockford, but Rockford tried to get um a free throw, couldn't get it. Um, and then Summer Davis got fouled, um, missed the first of the free throws, and then had to intentionally miss. Um, but they called the second one a lane violation, gave Rockford the ball. Rockford goes down, shoots two free throws, wins 40-36. Um, Rockford fans, um, Rockford um, Nation storm the court. Um, <laughs> you know, basically, you know, I mean, like, that was your whole ball game right there. I mean, you know, when you look at that game, there were a couple mistakes that I thought. I mean, when studying the three-point play by Lions, the three-point shot by Lions, um, <laughs> I thought, you know, they, their ball movement was very good in that final play. Their their ball movement was spectacular. I mean, it was just phenomenal ball movement by Rockford. Um, to get them side to side, um, get an open three from Grace Lyons. Now, Lyons hadn't scored a point until, um, until that three-point shot. You know, I mean, like, you know, here was a girl that was shut down by West Bloomfield. I mean... They did a really nice job on Lions. Um, the issue was for them was Winnipeg got going. She had 20 points. She had five threes. I mean, really, you know, I mean, it was going to be a tight game throughout, but I thought, you know, that the defense that, you know, West Mubia played on that final stretch, giving her that three point, that three pointer, they played good defense. I mean, they played, they played good defense. I mean, but I thought Kendall Hendricks got caught, and, you know, she got caught for about a second and then had to come back, and rec and, and it's hard to recover when you hit an open three um, like that. And, you know, so no offense to Kendall Hendricks. I mean, like, you know, I mean, like, um, you know, she had no chance in that play, really didn't. I mean, when they hit that three, you know, to give them the lead, um, this is where I think that, West Bluefield really panicked. They panicked after the Lions three. I mean, when what when summer when when the ball was given to um Destiny Washington, Washington tried throwing the ball to Kendall Hendricks and she couldn't catch it and it was and it was a turnover. Um and Rockford ended up getting the ball. Um there were a couple of things that I thought of, you know when watching that play. And I thought Coach Darren McAllister should have called a timeout there because, and I know that he hasn't called that timeout all year long, but in that type of situation, you know, you, I mean, like, I think, I think the timeout should have been called because one rock. Yeah. Rockford fans are going crazy, but, you know, just to calm your team down, you know, you just gave up a three, you're down one, you're actually, you're down two, you know, just tell your team to relax, you know, if you call time, I mean, like, you know, make a play, make a play, set up a good play, I mean, like, you know, if, you know, you, I mean, like, if you do that, you know what I mean, then, you know, you know, then you you don't know what's going to happen, but, but what West Bluefield did was they just went straight out run and gun, and they just threw the ball away. And you know, if if they did, if they they should have called a timeout there, because if they, bottom line, you know what I mean, like you know, and that's a sign of a team that panics. They they, they panicked. Bottom line, you know, and, and if you don't believe me, look at the tape, you know. You think about it, you know, you think about it for a second there. You know, you have those five seconds. If Darren McAllister called this a timeout, you know, 
then, yeah, Rockford's got momentum, but you slow the game down. You at least talk to your team to call a play, you know, like a good play. I mean, you have playmakers on that team. I mean, you have both Hendricks sisters, you had both Davis sisters, and you have, of course, Destiny Washington. So that's one of the um, that's one of the plays that I thought personally, um, when watching that game, um, I thought Darren McAllister made made that mistake. He should have called a timeout there, um, to to at least um, talk to his team and um, you know, instead of them rushing it, you know, you know, and rushing it and then throwing an errant pass, you know, uh, down the court to the sideline. I'm down the court to the um, end line. I mean, like, that's really where I think, you know, and I think that's a sign of, yeah, West Bloom has been used to this. I get it. But, but in that situation, and you have to call a timeout there. I mean, and, and West Bloomfield's rarely been in this situation where they've been in a really tight game. I mean, you really look at, the last few months. I mean, obviously their two losses, you know, the South Bend, Washington, Indiana, and um Ypsilanti Arbor Prep, those games, you know what I mean, they blew those games. I mean the the South Bend Washington game, that was a great game. I really felt like the Ypsilanti Arbor Prep game, they blew that game. Um and then, you know, in this situation, you know, you haven't been in this situation before. I mean you look at it and you gotta look at of course all the games they won were blowouts. All the games they won were blowouts. So they really hadn't had a moment where in a tight game, you know, you know, that if they're in a real tight game, you know, just call a timeout, you know, to calm the troops down. And to me, that loss with West Bloomfield to Rockford, that's a team loss. That is a team loss right there. And honestly, you know, that's what happened. I mean, Rockford was motivated. They wanted to get back at West Bloomfield. You know, and they did it. They were motivated. They had the game plan. I mean, slow the game down. I mean, shut the Davis sisters down. They got it held both of them to 12 combined points. That's insane considering how good the Davis sisters have been all year long. Then you got the Hendricks sisters in the foul trouble. You got both Sydney and Kendall both in the foul trouble. And they got West Bloomfield into some foul trouble early. And when you look at West Bloomfield, they're not a deep team to begin with. I mean, you could say all the good things about Sheridan Beal, um, um, Gabby Hill, um, I mean, like, you could say it, but th honestly, this is not a deep team. They were not. And, and even Lord, you know, I mean, honestly, they're not a deep team. And the bottom line is, that's what happened. Was, Rock was Rockford got to West Bloomfield, in, they got him in the foul trouble. You get him in the foul trouble, they got some issues. And you got to wonder. You have to wonder. What could have been for West Bloomfield? And then you look at the press conference. I mean, Kendall Hendricks. I heard what she said in the press conference. And there were some things I was, I, I think, she, I know she was in the moment. I know she was. She said some strong words. Saying that next year, they're the team that is, that, that they're going to be the um, hunters next year. Here's my take on it. West Bloomfield's one of the top teams in the league. They're one of the top teams. They're going to be a state power next year. But you got others that are going to be very good next year, too, in the state. When you look at teams like Rockford, who they got coming back. They got Lions and then the Younger Winnipeg coming back. You look at a team like, you know, Detroit Renaissance. They were a, a, virtually a young team this year. You look at. I mean, like, there's others in the state that are going to be very good next year. And West Bloomfield's one of those teams. <laughs> but I just think that, I just think for Kendall Hendricks, in my opinion, you know, 
Just lay low. Lay low. You know, next year, you know what I mean? I know you guys, I mean, like, I know you guys, you know, wanted the big trophy, wanted the big state trophy. I get it. Everybody does. It is one of the hardest trophies to get in sports is that state title. Um, you guys won 26 games this year. You went, you made the state final back-to-back -back years. You won the dang thing last year. You know, and I think that's a good success. You guys have had a good, successful season. I mean, and you got a lot coming back. You got four starters coming back. You lose two seniors. I mean, Jada Vaughn didn't play a lot, but she was a good, she was a huge part of this, of that team. But then you lose Sidney Hendricks. Sidney Hendricks going to Florida A&M next year. So when you look at West Bloom, you're going back. I mean, there are a lot of great moments for this team. Yeah, they've won a lot of those games they won were blowouts. I mean, I do question some of those. If West Bloomfield had games that were in tight knit games, does this happen to him? I mean, does this happen to him? I mean, bottom line was, and I agreed with Coach Darren McAllister's comments to Matt Bowery that Rockford was the better team. You know, and they were. I mean, they played. A style of play. You look at West Bloomfield. A lot of people know West Bloomfield's style of play. It's fast-paced, run and gun. Rockford slowed him down. Made him run set plays. Set mo set offense. And they, they kept West Bloomfield from dribble driving. And they did a good job. They did a good job containing West Bloomfield's dribble drive. And you got to get credit where credit's due. You got to get credit to Rockford. Got to. I mean, Rockford's, they finished the year, I think, 27-1. and one. I mean, their only loss, I think, was the Grand Rapids West Catholic. And that was over at, um, on the west side of the state. It was a low-scoring game there. Um, but Rockford has had some good wins this year. I mean, you know, you look at, of course, obviously, you know, the west side of the state. You look at, obviously, Hudsonville is another team to really look at out there on the west side. Um, but to, to West, back to West Bloomfield, I know a lot of people are, are shocked. I know a lot of people are, you know, just stunned how this team lost to Rockford. I mean, there were others that said, well, you know, West, I mean, like, West Bloom, yeah, West Bloom is top, is number, it's the top team to stay. I mean, yeah, they got a lot of talent coming back. But I've got some serious concerns when I look at West Bloomfield next year because obviously you lose Sidney Hendricks, you know, and then you're either going to have Sheridan Beal, Gabriel Hale, or Ava Lord step into one of those starting five spots. Um... Where's the rebounding going to come from? Where is the, um, where's the other depth going to come from? I mean, yeah, West Bloom is going to probably go at least seven deep next year. But, you know, there's some, but they're going to be a senior heavy team. I mean, two years from now, I think it's going to be the issue for West Bloomfield. Because, you know, you don't, because that talent pool there, yeah, it's good, but not to where the level they're at right now but you know and so i'm more concerned about west bloopia two years from now than i am next year because i think next year they're going to be a very good team i mean they're going to probably be the top team in the league in the oa next year obviously with what they got back um so when you look at the end of the year obviously you know when you look at the end of the girl season um Teams you got to keep an eye on next year, obviously, um, to watch this offseason. I'm watching West Bloomfield. I'm watching Rochester. Um, watching Stony Creek. I'm watching Clarkston carefully. I'm watching Lake Orion. Watching Oxford. Um, you know, I mean, you know, and then others. I'm watching Troy's. Another one I'm keeping an eye on this offseason. Um, how is North Farmington going to be next year? Losing a lot of experience. Um, I think when you look at the girls' season this year, it ended up being a really good year for the girls. I mean, obviously, you look at, 
you know, some of the best games um, this year. Obviously, I think the best away game, um, that featured an away team, I personally thought, and I might be a little biased here, but I thought Lake Orion Howell was a heck of a game between those two teams. Um, because those two teams went back and forth. Um, it was a heck of a game. Just a great game. And Lake Orion ended up winning that one 47-44. Um, the Dragons just did just enough in that game. Um, teams I'm keeping an eye on next year. I mean, like, obviously, if I had to do, like, a top 10, um, I pretty much would say, obviously, you got West Bloomfield there. Um, Rochester is one I'm keeping an eye on, especially when you look at, um, you know, Alice Max, Kylie Robinson. Um, Lucy Cook's a very interesting um, player for Rochester. I'm curious to see how she adjusts from the JV game to the varsity game. Um, so I'm curious to see how that's going to go there. Um, Clarkston, we know about, they got a lot of good experience coming back. I am curious to see how Eliana Roback can, he, I mean, like handles things now in her sophomore year, having a full year of varsity under her belt. Um, so I'm very curious to see how that team is going to be. Um, Oxford with four starters back on the Van Woods injury. Um, can Oxford um, develop their depth? That's going to be the interesting question for Coach Rachel Breyer. <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on this offseason. Stony Creek, of course, Ivan um, Elage, she's another one I'm high on for Stony Creek um, to go along with um, Sarah LaPrairie. Um, coming back. So Stoney, I think, and of course, Merrick Schlaubach. Um, so I think Stoney's going to be a player next year as well. And then, of course, you got Lake Orion. I mean, Lake Orion's interesting because they lose nine seniors. Obviously, it's, it's hard to replace nine seniors, but you got Izzy Walensky, um, who missed, you know, who missed most of the year with, the, with an ACL injury, but she was in there. She was really good for Coach Bob Bridges. Um, Charlotte Poblowski, <laughs> I expect her to take on a much bigger role next year. Um, you got Ryan Pelajak is another one. Um, Pelajak, you know, has had moments of greatness for Lake Orion. And I think that Lake Orion can be a player next year. Um, even though I expect him to take a little bit of a step back. Um, and then there's Troy. I mean, you know, Troy, I think with them, I'm high on them, especially with their young nucleus, the Diamond Prince, Olivia Spangler, and... Um, and of course, Reagan Zider and Charlotte Higgin and um, and um Charlotte Higginbottom. Um, there's a young nucleus there for Troy. It's just getting him developed, you know, getting him, you know, getting him developed. And of course, you have Macy Zider, who is gonna be heading into eighth grade next year. Um, so there's a lot of excitement for Troy. It's just gonna take some time for them, you know, to just get everything down. I think going down in division will help them um going forward there. Um, Harper Woods, I think the team to really watch for, they got everybody back next year. Um, and then of course, Bloomfield Hills is another team I'm really high on. I mean, Ruby Smith, Ashley Ford are coming back for coach. I'm Chris and Massey, um, tough loss to, um, Groves in the first round. Um, you know, that's another team I'm keeping an eye on. Um, also, um, you got Groves with, um, you know, I'm curious to see how they do without Caitlin Sanders. She graduates. Um, and then when you look at the blue, you know, when you look at the teams in that division, um, how will Farmington do? Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. I am also curious to see how Rochester Adams does next year. I think Adams will be a, be I think Adams will be better next year considering that, um, you know, they just, they had a lot of underclassmen this year. I really like Morgan McPherson a lot. I like Samantha Blaine a lot. I think that, I think that, um, coach Joe Marburg's got something there. Um, they got Faith Zolis on that team as well. I think that, um, you know, I think Adams is a team that I think could really watch for and make some noise next year. Um, but we're going to see what happens. I mean, like, I'm very curious to see how, you know, the, this is going to stack up. The divisions are going to restack up and everything, um, heading into next year. But when you look at recapping this season, um, obviously the, um, you know, when he, obviously the, um, you know, the girls season uh, had a great year for girls basketball. Um, West Bloomfield, them battling tough in the, um, in the, in the division one state finals and losing a tough one to Rockford. Um, I think a couple mistakes were made in that game, but 
you know, you got to give West Blueby a lot of credit. I'm great year for them. A great year for everybody in the OA. Um, obviously, of course, you know, Lake Orion and Rochester both were regional in the regional rounds um, within the OA this year. Um, so, and of course, they had North Farms undefeated season at 22 and 0. Um, they do lose a lot of talent, though. So, but otherwise, it was a great year for the OA in general for girls basketball. So, that's my take on girls basketball. Um, let's go now to boys basketball. Um, we just had the regionals. Um, you know, I, I I know a lot of people are going to talk about what happened in North Farmington um, following the Orchard Lake St. Mary's in the regional final. Um, you know, North Farmington, they did get by Troy. Um, that was a 54-48. It was a really good game there. Um, I got to give Coach Gary Fralick's team a lot of credit for just battling and competing. You know, they, they played a well hard fought game on their home floor against a good opponent. Um Mason Parker had a nice game. Darius Whiteside um had had his moments. John Whiteside I thought had his moments. I kinda wish that, that John Whiteside buzzer beater should have counted. Um I think it would have been really interesting if that if that counted, um, in all reality. But um you know, either way, you got to get credit to Troy. I mean, they had a great year. Um, they do lose. Um, they do lose Darius Whiteside. They do lose. Um, they lose Zach Pinoza. Um, both those two guys, but they do return three starters: Chase Kuyper, Brady, I mean Mason Parker, and um, and um, also they lose Carter Cosmano as well. Um, but they do got a couple starters coming back. Obviously, Chase Kuyper, John Whiteside, and um, and of course Mason Parker. So. A lot to like with Troy. I mean, heading for heading into next year for them. Um, and then the North Farmington game against Orchard Lake St. Mary's. This is where, you know, I know Coach Todd Negotian went on Facebook and did a rant about it. Um, you know, about the MHA when it comes to officials and all that. You know, and yeah, I get it, you know. First of all, in my opinion, I don't know how referees are assigned in the in the postseason. Um, I just think that, you know, they shouldn't be aligned with one league. I mean, like, obviously, and I feel like a couple of them were affiliated with the Catholic League. Um, you know, and there were a couple calls that were just absolutely atrocious in that, especially in the second half. I mean, you know, North Farmington, they had the game control early. And then Orchard Lake St. Mary's battled back. A lot of that was because of Trey McKinney. Um, and then, you know, 34-34 heading in the fourth quarter. And then McKinney basically takes over that game, and Orchard Lake St. Mary's wins that one. Um, you know, people are going to look at, at this and say, you know, and the officiating in that game, and I, and I watched a film on that, and I thought the officiating was very dubious against North Farmington. Um, just a couple calls that just didn't go their way. Um, you know, and I get Coach Todd Negotiations beat, and his dad was very upset as well. Um, and, of course, you know, Pete Mantella was also upset as well. Um, when you look at, you know, I mean, like, and, of course, one thing that gets me a little annoyed a little bit, you look at the prep on YouTube, um, you know, they look at some of the top notch teams. A lot of a lot of they have a lot of games in the Catholic League. They've had a couple OA games this year. They've had Troy, they've had North Farmington, they've had Ferndale. Um I just think that, you know, you know, I just think, you know, obviously when you have, you know, if you have a Catholic League refs, then in my opinion they shouldn't be doing it. Because, you know, you're in the you're in March Madness, man. I mean, you're in March Madness. I mean like you know, if you're an assigner, you know, the referees, you know, and I'm I'm not blasting anybody here, but I just feel like, you know, you know, and I and I get Coach Todd Negotian's beef. I mean, like, he felt in that game that, you know, the referees screwed. And and I watched a film on that and I would have to concur. I mean, it's very unfortunate, but that's what happens. So now Orchard Lake St. Mary's moves on to take on Warren D. The Sal in the regional fine in the re in the state court finals. Um, so I kind of understand the Goshen's beef here. Um, but at the end of the day, 
you know, and they let Trey McKinney go off, you know, and McKinney got a lot of superstar calls. And to me, it wasn't surprising that McKinney got the superstar calls because, you know, you, everybody knows his story. Everybody knows that. And to me, do I, did I like what he did? Absolutely not. Because one thing you never do is you announce your high school recruitment to go somewhere. You normally do that for colleges. You don't do that for high school. Um, kind of an immature, selfish move there, I thought. But bottom line was, you know, Trey McKinney went off in that game, and he's the reason why Orchard Lake St. Mary's in the regional is in the state quarterfinals. And I said this before last week. If Orchard Lake St. Mary's were to win Division One state title, I know it would be a nightmare for the MHA, obviously, because considering, considering what's been going on with the um, transfer case over there involving the three players, um, you know, that Orchard Lake St. Mary's had to deal with. So, so I get North Farmington's beef here. I mean, did they get ripped off? Yeah, they did. Bottom line. But they didn't make enough plays down the stretch, though, to win that game, though, against Orchard Lake St. Mary's. So, kind of a double-edged sword when you look at what the Raiders, uh, what the Raiders this season. Um, and then the regional over at Fenton. Uh, well, actually, let's go to the regional over at um, Hazel Park first. Um. This is where I thought, you know, this was going to be a tough district for Ferndale. Tough regional for Ferndale. I mean, the district had a lot of good teams in there. I thought, you know, for Ferndale, of course, the um, Detroit Old Redford Academy was better than I thought. But Ferndale managed to win that one. Um, the game against Detroit University Prep was a revenge game for Ferndale. Um, I thought, you know, they went and took care of business. Scored a very high number. Um... They, a lot of players got involved. Um, so Ferndale knocked off Detroit University Prep, of course, coached by former Hazel Park coach Brendan Barrett. Um, it was a good win for them. Bounce back win for them after a 55-53 loss um, earlier in the year over at Wayne State. Um, and then they knocked off Warren Michigan Collegiate in a, um, another good game. Um so when you look at Ferndale right now, they're gaining a lot of confidence. You look at players like Caleb Defoe, you look at um, you know, you look at um Caleb Renfro, you look at um Chris Williams, you look at um, you know, there's there's a lot of others I can't I, I can name in this pod. But Coach Juan Rickman's got that team rolling right now. They're a well oiled machine right now. And I think when you look at Ferndale, um, they're clicking on all cylinders right now, just with the way they're playing. Um, I think they're playing their best basketball right now. And a lot of people look at what Ferndale's done. Obviously, you know, you know, getting to Breslin on the last two years, if um, they can get by Goodridge, it'll be three years straight. Um, but we'll preview that Goodridge game because um, I think that's going to be a very interesting game and a clash of two different styles. Um, but when you look at Ferndale, they love run and gun. They love to go up and down. And, and score the basketball. I mean, that's always been Ferndale style. That, um, you know, sort of like that Detroit style type play. And they're getting the job done. I mean, they're getting the job done. They're producing results. I mean, they had a tough time in the division this year a little bit. I mean, like, obviously, we, you, you know, when you look at with North Farmington winning it, Ferndale was second in that division behind um, North Farmington. I mean, the red this year was really brutal. Um, so for Ferndale, great win for them, moving to state quarterfinals. Going to be previewing that game against Goodridge um, coming up, um, which I think is going to be really interesting. Um, and then the um, regional at Fenton. Um, you know, when you look at this game, I thought, you know, you had Clarkson taking on um, Fenton, and then, of course, you had Adams taking on Milford. Um, Adams had some issues with Milford early. I mean, maybe it was the um, district championship hangover they had against Utica Eisenhower or something. But, you know, Brady Priest scored and kept them in that game. And then um, Peter Caracas got going in that third quarter when he unleashed five threes, I believe, on him. I mean, like, my goodness. I mean, I know how good Peter Kardashian is. I know how good of a player he is. He can shoot threes when need be. Him and William G are very good three-point shooters. 
I mean, obviously, when you look at Adams, um, they don't really have a true point guard. But, you know, in, in a Jared Thomas offense, you really don't need one. But you've got playmakers at the guard spots. I mean, then you have a big and Brady Priest score. You have Brocker Cowell, who is a, who is a bruiser inside. I mean, you got, you got Handler also on the inside as well. I mean, like, you look at Adams, and you got to credit what Coach Jared Thomas has done, obviously. But for them, the difference in that game against Milford was the three-point shot. And then Brady Priestborn, Priestborn kept them in, in it, you know, just for Caracas to go off. So that was a good win for Adams, knocking off a good Milford team. But I think the game of the tournament had to be Clarkston against Benton. I mean, I listened to the game on 93.5 WHNI um, with Dan Leach. Of course, Dan Leach does a really great job. Um, I mean, like, if you want to, I can post a link of his game against Lake Orion and the girls. Um, in girls basketball, I can post that link if you want me to. Um, you just got to ask me on um, Just got to ask me on Twitter if you want to do that. Um, when you look at that game, I mean, Clarkston, it went back and forth, back and forth. I mean, Clarkson never panicked. They never panicked, especially behind the play of Desmond Steffens and, um, and um, Brady Cozen. I mean, both those guys had big games against Benton. I mean, I think Stevens had 30, and I think Cozen had 20 in that game. Um, but it went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Then they go to overtime. I mean, Fenton had the chance to win it. Can't hit free throws. They missed six free throws in that stretch. Gave Clarkson a chance. Clarkson had a chance to win it at the buzzer. Couldn't get it. Go to double overtime. And then all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Clarkson, like, um, you know, Fenton hits a three-pointer, but the clock runs. Game over. Clarkson wins. Moves on. Credit to coach Tim Wasilek. Also credit to Clarkson's players for not giving up and not giving in in that game where they had plenty of opportunities to do it. But let's not forget, this Clarkson team has been here before. I mean, this is not the most talented Clarkson team we've had. I mean, they're not, I mean, like, you know, last, this year they finished last in the red, which is just completely mind-boggling if you're Clarkston in Clarkson standards for finishing last in the division. I mean, that is just mind-boggling. But, you know, they overcame, oh, I mean, like, they survived the hostile crowd up in Fenton, um, and it was a heck of a basketball game between those two teams. I mean, it was a heck of a game. Um, and then, of course, came the regional final between Clarkson and Adams, um, ended up being what I thought it would be. I mean, I mean, Clarkson led early, and then Cardasis kind of exploded in the fourth quarter, um, and Adams ended up winning the first ever regional final in school history by knocking off Clarkson, and I think that's the first time... <laughs> that I've seen Adams beat Clarkson three times in one year. And we know how good Adams is. Obviously, you know, you kind of look at, obviously, the um, with Adams and Clarkson, that rivalry, football is probably the one that people got to look at. But also, let's not forget boys basketball. Clarkson eliminated Adams in the um, regional semifinal last season. And when you look at the football game between Adams and Clarkson, Clarkson beat Adams. On a last second touchdown, catch to Desmond Stevens. And that was your ball game. And 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 Adams and Adams had a heck of a team that year. Senior heavy team. And a lot of those players, particularly those who played football, um, I know Brady Prescore was on that team. Brocker Cowell was on that team. Um, that lost on the final play to Clarkston. Um, for them, and then of course to beat Clarkston three times in one year in boys basketball. That kind of that kind of justifies things for them, you know. When you look at Adams as a class, this class of 2023, you know, obviously when you win the boys soccer title, you win a state title, and um, you win a state title in girls golf, 
and then you were second in competitive cheer. I mean, and now you're making this boys basketball run, and we're not even in the spring yet. So that's a credit to Adams's athletic department. You know, they're in, this is a great moment for the community over at Rochester Adams. Just enjoy the moment. You know, that's what I would say to them right now is basically enjoy the moment. So Adams moves on the state quarterfinal. They will take on Grand Blank. Um, of course, both games will be at Lake Orion. Um, so we're going to preview the quarterfinal um, for both for both teams. Of course, it's like an OA versus Genesee County um, matchup over in Lake Orion. Um, of course, both Genesee County teams are the home team. Um, we were in white. I mean, Ferndale will be probably wearing black. Adams will probably be wearing black as well. Um, for their um, quarterfinal game. And I'll tell you what, I think both OA teams got a chance in this game. I think I'm confident with Ferndale against Goodrich. Grand Blank and Adams, I think that could be very interesting. Because Grand Blank did not look very good against Mount Pleasant. Um, and Mount Pleasant had two chances to beat him, but missed it. And that game went overtime over there at Saginaw Heritage. <laughs> so... The first game we're going to talk about is going to be between um, Ferndale and Goodrich, of course. These are two teams that have different styles. Obviously, Goodrich is coming off a good win against Croswell Lex in the um, regional final where um, it was a 51-37 game. Um, credit to Goodrich's defense for shutting down um, for shutting down Croswell Lexington. Um, Croswell Lexington, that regional was very tough because you had Pontiac Nord and Prep in there. You had Croswell Lexington in there. You had Goodrich in there. I mean, it was not an easy district, easy regional um, over at MLA City. It really wasn't. Um, Ferndale, we know they played a tough regional as well, of course, beating Warren Michigan Collegiate, beating Detroit University Prep um, to get to um, to get to um, Lake Orion for the um, state quarterfinals. Obviously, the matchup, the key is going to be is it's different tempo, different style. I think that's going to be the key. Because bottom line is, you know, whoever style wins will move on to the Breslin Center. Ferndale, we know, plays a frantic pace. The Detroit style type offense. But they have, I think, more multiple weapons this year than they did last year. Obviously, they had Jason Drake and um, Simon. We, I mean, like, um, they had Simon. They had, um, oh, my goodness. I can't remember the names of them now. Jason Drake and um, Travion Lewis. Um Obviously, they don't have those two type players anymore, but they have a lot more balanced scoring, I thought. You know, a lot more options for them to have. Um, and I think this is what makes Ferndale that much more dangerous is when you have those type of players, you know, that can contribute, you know, in different ways, that's going to make you a very good basketball team. I mean, and then on the other side of things, you look at, on the other side of things, you look at um, Goodrich, they want to slow it down, scrap, claw. They'll they'll do that style. I mean, obviously, you look at what the season they've had this year. I mean, they are going to be they're going to be a tough they're they're a tough team. You know, they're they're going to be a very tough team. Um, I think when you look at this matchup inside out, though, I, I just think that Ferndale has a little bit more options in this game. I mean, they played a more tougher schedule. I mean. Their schedule this year is just beyond ridiculous, especially our non-conference was just, I mean, like one of the most brutal schedules I have ever seen. I mean, like when you look at playing teams like Muskegon, you're playing against Orchard Lake St. Mary's, you're playing against, um, you know, Detroit University Prep, you're playing against, you know, some of the top perennial powers in the state of Michigan. I mean, my goodness. Then you're playing a team in Ohio who is very good. I think Cleveland Heights, Ohio, you played them earlier in the year, and we know how good that team is. And so when I look at Ferndale, I mean, they played a tough schedule. There's no doubt about it. Goodridge, obviously, they're in the Metro um, the Foot Metro League. Um, good team. They're a good team. Well-coached team. I know, that coach, I know their coaching staff very well over there. Um, so I think we're going to be in for an interesting game, but I just think from a talent perspective, if this turns into a high scoring game, you got to give an edge to Ferndale there. If it turns into a, um, 
defensive, if it turns into a, um, in, if it turns into an offensive slugfest advantage for them because of, they have more playmakers, they are more than capable of scoring, um, just different options when you look at that game. Um, so I got an edge to Ferndale here in that matchup for sure in that one. Um, let's look at the other matchup. Obviously, you know, on the Division One side of things, you got Adams taking on Grand Blank. Um, when, I, when you asked me about this matchup, if the matchup happened about two months ago, I would have told you Adams was dead in the water. I mean, that's how bad, that's how much I would have said with confidence. I thought Adams would have been dead in the water. But now, looking at this game, I'm saying, hmm, I don't know. I mean, yeah, Grand Blank's got experience. I mean, they got R.J. Taylor. They got Taj Boyd. They got, um, you know, Bryce O'Mara, well coached, and the first-year coach, Tory Jackson. Done a really good job with Grand Blank. Um, <laughs> then you look at Adams. They're a team with nothing to lose, everything to gain. Um, you know, coming and looking for some respect. Um, I really think in this matchup, Brady pre-scoring is the key. Because you look at Brady pre-scoring, and, you know, he the type of kid he is. Humble kid, strong kid. Um, you know, I think he, I mean, like, um, you know, great athlete. Um, when I look at this matchup here, obviously the guard matchup is going to favor Grand Blank because of R.J. Taylor and um, because of R.J. Taylor. Um, but I think Adams has a shot here Be in the guards. I think, you know, you look at if Peter Cardasis is on shooting. Um, and if William G is on shooting, I'll tell you what, I think Adams got a chance in this game. I mean, Noah Kim's a heck of a, of a player. He's not big. I mean, he's not a big player, but he's got a big heart. Utica Eisenhower is going to remember his name. Basically, um. Basically, um, I think Utica Eisenhower remembers Noah Kim's name because he was the one that got the rebound that set the, the three up for G, and that was your ballgame. I mean, it's clear to me, you know, when you look at this matchup, I think Brady pre-scored. If he gets in the foul trouble, Adams is done. I mean, I'm not knocking on Coach Jared Thomas's team. He's done a great job. But it looks like when you look at the keys of the game, and you look at in in the end that matchup, if Brady pre-score and get gets in the foul trouble, Adams is done for. I mean, no offense. I mean, but then again, Grand Blank had some trouble with them with Mount Pleasant. I mean, they, it was a one point game that went into overtime. And I credit Mount Pleasant for that. They shut down they shut down Grand Blank just enough. You know, they had a chance to win. They had two attempts at it and just couldn't get it in. So, I think Adams has a chance in this game. They're going to have to play well. I mean, they're coming in with nothing to lose. I mean, I noticed on Twitter, you know, that both um, Genesee County Schools, Grand Blank and Goodridge, want to merge, you know, for to um, in one big student section. And then, of course, you have the gold rush over at Adams. And then you have um, Ferndale student section. Um, so it'll be very interesting. I think I expect both student sections will come out in full force. Um, I have a lot of confidence in the gold rush um, <laughs> that they will come out in full force. Because they were there over at Utica Eisenhower. Um, I felt bad for them. Obviously, with the um, what happened with the student sections, obviously, um, having to go up top um, for the district final, um, that was a very difficult um, scenario for them. Um, but they managed through it, and voila, Adams is in the um, regionals. And then, of course, um, so I get the Gold Rush a lot of credit for that. Um. So when I look at the projections for the games, obviously, I mentioned it earlier. Um, I really like Ferndale to knock off Goodrich. I just think that, um, you know, I just think Ferndale's got enough offensive prowess, firepower. I think the winner takes on Grand Rapids Catholic Central. 
most likely, if you think that, I mean, like, Ferndale and Grand Rapids Catholic Central, we know has got a got a big rivalry there between those two teams. Um, obviously, it was Grand Rapids Catholic Central that knocked off Ferndale the last two years. Now, I haven't looked at the um, Division Two side of the bracket or the Division One side yet of the where the state semifinals and the state finals are yet. That'll be on my blog at um, Saginaw Bay 4650 at blogspot.com um, to preview those matchups um, if both OA schools were to advance. Um, of course, when you look at Grand Blank and, and um, Adams, as I mentioned earlier, if this match would have been two months ago, Adams would have been dead in the water. But I got to give Coach Jared Thomas and his team a lot of credit. I mean, what he has done at Adams in his three years there, Adams was not. Adams was basically struggling. They were struggling to get kids in the program. They were struggling to get an identity. They were struggling. They weren't the same team when Brad Crichton left the program. And then when Thomas came back, and when Thomas came into the picture, he wasn't even their first choice. I mean, Nick Ebola was their, was supposed to be the head coach, but he turned down, turned down the job a couple a week later and Thomas got the job at Adams, and look what Thomas has done. First year, give him a pass. I would give Thomas a pass first year. But then the next two years, he's won district titles. He's won a regional title, playing in one of the toughest divisions in the state of Michigan. I'll tell you what, that is a credit. I'll tell you what, I mean, Jared Thomas has to be one of the top coaches, you know, uh, if he had to put a Mount Rushmore of Adams basketball coaches, I would put him right right there with John Hall. And that says a lot. We know how good John Hall was as a coach at Adams. But I would put Jared Thomas right up there with him. I mean, that's how good of a coach he is. That's how good of a person he is. He's a great man. Great man to talk to. Great man to um, you know, talk life with. Great, great person to talk to. Um Obviously, when you look at his team, um, humble, humble team, obviously. Program strength is there. I mean, their freshman's solid. Their JV's solid. I mean, he's got that program built for not only the now, but also in the long term. And if you're an Adams fan, that's got to get you excited. Because when you look at the job that he's done and everything he's done there, I mean, he's been he's been to other games. I mean, like for football games, he's been to like soccer games, he's been to baseball games. I mean, like, you know, and that says a lot. That tells me that tells you, and he's put together a heck of a staff too over there at Adams. He's done a really good job. He brought in Paris Pereira um from Rochester. Of course, we know how good Pereira was at Rochester. Um he's done a great job over at Adams. He's done a wonderful job over there. Um, the game with Grand Blank and Adams, as I mentioned, the guard matchup is going to be key. Um, does Adams have a solid defender to go to put on RJ Taylor? That's going to be the key there. And can pre-scoring do enough to stay out of foul trouble against Taj Boyd? If Taj Boyd gets into foul trouble, Bryson Meyer gets into foul trouble, then it's going to get really interesting because Adams can shoot your way, shoot your way in the game, or they can shoot your way out of the game. I mean, that's going to be the key when I look at Rochester Adams and Graham Lake. I think Adams has enough to get by this one. But my heart, but my heart, te- but my gut tells me I just don't know. But when you're a team that's playing nothing to lose and everything to gain, why not? So I talked to Ian Locke, always tells me, the co host here, at the, um, my co host, um, he, says, you know, be brave to pick the upset. If you think if you think Adams can go and beat Grand Blank, you should pick the upset. You know what? I'm going to pick the upset. I'm going to take Adams. I know my brother, my co-host in between Terminas, Anthony Terminas, is going Grand Blank. Um, so I'm going I'm going Adams in this one. It'll be a heck of a game. I think it'll be very interesting. So, it'll be a good game. It'll be a really good game. So we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. All right, everybody, I'm going to sign off here. Make sure you stay to the blog at um, Saginaw Bay 4650 at blogspot.com. 
I have posted the shortcomings for girls' basketball. Um, the boys' basketball will come at the conclusion of the OAA season. Of course, this is the last week of basketball season before we go into spring break. And then we talk, we go into spring sports season. So, a lot to look forward to heading into the um, spring. Um, you know, around the OA, obviously, when you look at what's going to happen coming up. So, all right, I'm going to sign off here. Make sure you follow the blog at setting up 4650 at blogspot.com. We'll see what happens. Take care. God bless, and I'll see you on next week, everybody. See you next week. God bless all.